angel investing, which I started doing, investing in cryptocurrency and learning about new technologies, and then wine investing. I remember coming across a few reports uh, touting its returns, how it's really, really stable and consistent over the past few decades, and how its annualized returns had actually, I think, around 11 or 12% annualized returns over the past 25 years had beaten out the stock market. I was like, wow, this is so cool, right? I would love to be a little bit more cultured and learn more about wine anyways. And this seems like a great way to get some skin in the game and potentially make a profit as well. And that's really where the initial idea for VinoVest started to blossom. The LA Business Journal described today's guest as the epitome of a dogged entrepreneur. If you're interested in entrepreneurship or wine, this is a must watch. Welcome to the Inspired Money Podcast, where we explore positive money stories. I'm Andy, your host and financial advisor at Runnymede Capital Management. Let's shift our perspectives on money, get inspired so we can make a bigger impact in the world. Thank you for tuning in. Please hit subscribe for Inspired Money interviews and money tips. Our guest is Anthony Zhang. In part one of this episode, you're going to hear an incredible entrepreneur's journey. Anthony has run venture-backed companies since he was 18 years old. He secured investments from Mark Cuban and Mark Burnett and received a $100,000 fellowship from billionaire Peter Thiel to drop out of college. With a bright future and fast-growing company, Anthony was at a pool party in Las Vegas when tragedy struck. He dove into a pool, misjudging the depth, and broke his neck. This instantly left him a quadriplegic. Now only 25 years old, Anthony has sold two companies and co-founded his third, VinoVest, an online platform for investing in fine wines. In the second half of this episode, we explore wine investing. In this episode, you'll learn what it was like pitching Mark Cuban and Mark Burnett as a college student. Guys. and to get funded. Different motivations for starting companies from food delivery to colleges to rating VCs and why Anthony wants to bring wine investing to everyone and believes it's an alternative asset class worth considering. Now let's get inspired with Anthony Zhang. Anthony, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Absolutely, Andy. I'm really happy to be on here as well. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? Ooh, so earliest childhood memory of money, I think, was when I was in elementary school, um, just in reward for going to um, different sort of community programs, and doing my homework on time and doing uh, household chores, I would get a stipend from my parents. What kind of stipend? And is that different from an allowance? It was, I'd say it's, you know, pretty similar to allowance, but um, instead of getting money, I would just get things. So um, I knew that, um, you know, these sort of like, you know, the currency that I was getting in rewards for being a good kid was getting, say, a, a toy, right? Or um, saving up for, um, you know, an ice cream bar at the end of end of the week after you know, sports practice. So um, that's really kind of what my earliest associations of, of monetary value were. A currency that you understood as a kid. Exactly. I had no idea, you know, what the actual conversions were. You know, maybe I was getting, you know, getting fleeced by my parents, but well, who knows? <laughs> Anthony, you're in your mid twenties and you're running your third company. Before we get into investing in wine. It looks like you were born to be an entrepreneur. Were there early signs of that as a kid who was working for toys? I think I had always loved the idea of being able to start my own company. Um, I went to college for entrepreneurship. Um, the goal was always to eventually start my own company. I thought it was really cool being able to create something out of nothing. So I think the interest was always there. Is it true that you skipped class to go pitch Mark Cuban and Mark Burnett? Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, this was right when I had started USC, uh, you know, I was in the business program there. So we're doing a lot of entrepreneurship classes. And it just happened that uh, the speech that Mark Cuban and Mark Burnett were giving was overlapping with one of my classes. And 
I had asked my professor for permission to be able to miss that class. And he was like, hey, if you, if you miss this class, we're actually going to dock you an entire letter grade. Um, and I was like, I don't care. I want to go see Mark Cuban. So um, luckily, I was able to get a much better result out of the, um, you know, out of pitching Mark Cuban, got my first investment offer. And um, another kind of funny backstory is in that entrepreneurship class, part of the syllabus read that if the class in cumulative over the semester was able to raise $25,000, the entire class got A's. So in that one night, I raised $100,000. So even though he was going to dock me um, an entire letter grade, it didn't matter because the entire class got A's for the semester. Did that risk analysis play a part in your deciding to go or not? Uh, absolutely not. I just wanted to watch him. He was one of my idols, and I didn't even know I was going to get the opportunity to pitch it, much less get an offer. So, um, yeah, I would say there was not much risk analysis or opportunity cost analysis being done at that moment. But I remembered after I got the investment about that rule in the syllabus, and uh, that made me pretty happy. So I think that first business was Envoy Now, a food discovery business for students. Was it scary pitching Mark Cuban and Mark Burnett? Yes. Um, you know, I'd, I'd done some college pitches, but the stakes were much, much higher when you're pitching a billionaire shark. And um, the fact that it was also recorded as well um, definitely gave me some jitters. So um, pretty safe to say, I, I think I blacked out the entire time. I really have no recollection of how the pitch really went until the final moment. Uh, so yeah, I was, I was really scared. Have you watched that video afterwards to like re-experience it? Yeah, I have. And it probably took me about one or two years after the video was even published to even like get the, get the guts to watch it again. Cause I don't know if you're one of those people where like, if you hear yourself or see yourself when it's being recorded or played back, just cringe like at the things that I say or how I sound. And uh, I had always been kind of critical of myself like that. So it was um, kind of nervous to even see it. And now I've seen it a couple of times, but every single time I'm like, oh man, why did I say that? Or thank God this didn't happen or something like that. So you walked away with a $100,000 investment? Yeah, so the offer was for $100,000 for 10% of the company. And where was the company at that point? Was it already running? Yeah, so the business was up and running. We actually had expanded, just expanded to two additional markets outside of my uh, my school, USC. So we were really in a pretty quick, uh, quick growth path. Um, in terms of scale, though, we were still relatively small, right? We only had a few thousand students using the app. Um, and we're still in its infant stages. And you went on to get a Thiel Fellowship grant. At what point do you leave school and make that decision? So that was, I think, just a few weeks after the Mark Cuban pitch is when I got the call from the Thiel Fellowship. And they had asked me if I would have heard of the program and if I would be interested in uh, learning more about it and applying for it. I think the actual um, acceptance notice was not until a few months later, but at that point, you know, even before then, I really wasn't spending much time in school. Even the time in school was spent on working on my business. Um, as kind of we talked about earlier, I was already skipping class to do business things. So I was like, all right, well, I'm spending more time on my business than not. And now there's people actually paying me to drop out of school versus spending money to be in school. So it was kind of a no brainer. Yeah. I noticed that the Teal Fellowship, it's a two year program for young people who want to skip or drop out of college as an entrepreneur who has sold businesses and is running businesses. What is your view on the value of a college degree? I absolutely loved going to USC. Um, I met my now fiance there freshman year. I've made some amazing friends and 
Um, I also think that it's the, the perfect kind of breeding ground for a business, right? Um, you're able to test out a lot of things quickly and cheaply. As a college student, you're able to really be in a position to seek out a lot of advice and mentorship. Um, so I think for all those reasons, it is a, still really, really valuable. Um, I don't think the I don't think you need all four years to get that value, though. And for me, you know, I was able to get it in less than that. Um, obviously, something like the Teal Fellowship really forced me to make a decision. But um, I think that you don't really need a college degree to start a business. Looking at your resume, it just it it looks like you are moving at a lightning pace. Like, how long was it between? starting Envoy now and selling the company? It was about almost four years. So we had, it was kind of a grind in the beginning, you know, just being a 18 year old first time entrepreneur, not really knowing much. Um, but I think once I left school, um, things really did start to pick up in terms of our velocity, in terms of the rate of our growth. And, um, you know, at the end of 2016, early 2017, that's when we finalized the deal with Joyrun uh, to to be able to join them and, and grow it even into a, a bigger company there. How big a company was it? How many employees did you have? We had about 60 employees. We had 1,500 student drivers, so like delivery folks, and then... We had had over 100,000 students using the app at that point. Wow. And then within that time period, you had an accident that left you paralyzed. How did that impact the business? I mean, it stopped everything to a halt, right? I had a, a spinal cord injury where left that injury left me instantly a quadriplegic. Um, and I was fighting for my life. I was in the ICU for about five weeks, then spent the better part of the next 12 months in intensive rehab facilities, just learning how to do the most basic things, like even breathe without a ventilator. So um, the business was completely um, off of my mind, at least for those first few months. And I think about six months into my accident was when I came back as CEO. Um, you know, I was at a point where I was still doing rehabilitation full time, but um, I realized that in terms of getting me back to where I wanted to be, um, I didn't want to just shut out the world anymore. I actually didn't even look at my phone for the first three and a half months of my accident because I just had such a tough time accepting what had happened and just didn't want, you know, was, was essentially living in denial. And I realized that I really missed that part of my identity, which was being an entrepreneur and actually going back to the business and being able to focus some of my mental energy on something other than my day-to-day -day physical rehab um, was to me, even a, a form of therapy in itself. How do you think that experience changed your priorities or changed how you lead a company? I think in terms of my priorities, it definitely made me realize that I'm not invincible, right? My, my health and my life can be very, very fragile. And especially with how I lead a company too, I think it gave me just a lot more empathy because um, a lot of the investors, especially in you know, my, my current company or uh, my, even my second company, they had no idea about my condition, right? We're all on these Zoom calls every day. It's just heads and shoulders. I'd say about 99% of the people I talk to every day have no idea I'm in a wheelchair in my condition. Um, and that kind of made me realize, all right, well, I have a physical disability that is very, very apparent if you see me in person, but a lot of people are probably struggling with a ton of other things that may not be as apparent. And as a CEO, if you want to really take care of and nurture your employees, um, you want to be able to give people the space to be able to share that whenever they're comfortable. So that's something that um, I've really, you know, come to feel is pretty important in terms of building a great company culture. 
once you realized that you were going to live, because it sounds like there was a period there where you were fighting for your life, did that impact your confidence in your ability to lead your company? Like, did you feel like you weren't the same person that you were before? I feel like once I realized that this, you know, very, very trying time in, in my life was going to get better, I think it just gave me the strength to be able to persevere through other things, right? If if I can live on a ventilator for two and a half months and then get be able to be strong enough to get off of it, um, suddenly I think, you know, day-to-day -day business decisions or things that go wrong in a business, they just don't seem that bad. Um, I just feel a lot more even keeled. And I think just having a little bit more perspective on really what matters. Anthony, take us back to that time. What did that look like? You were still undergoing physical therapy, but you had to turn your company around from your hospital room. How do you do that? Um, a lot of... Uh... A lot of Zoom calls and uh, to be honest, a lot of the rest of my team really stepping up because um, about, I'd say about six to seven hours a day of my, of my schedule was still intensive rehabilitation. So I was just on Slack in between, you know, going from physical therapy to occupational therapy, just, you know, being able to, um, you know, guide or help my team members whenever they needed me. But I told them like, Hey, I would like to come back as CEO. I think that our company still has value. And I think that we can get acquired for a good result for everybody, but we just have to trust each other. We need to give 200%. And what I also did was really gave an expiration date too. I was like, if we do this and if by the end of the year, we don't feel like we've made any significant progress, then at least we can say we've tried. So, um, I felt like the entire team was really united underneath this renewed vision for the company. And that helped me not have to be so in the weeds of the day to day. Um, and also just being, I think, honest with the help that I needed. You know, I'm not, you know, there's, there's some things that I still can do just as well. There's a lot of things I can't do just as well. And um, just asking for that help and being able to be a little bit more honest and vulnerable with some of our, our key employees, I think really gave them the strength to step up and, and do more than they did before. Mm, important lessons in there. So you were able to sell the company to Joyrun in 2017. Where do you go from there? So I, I did stay with Joyrun for about a year. And then at, at that time, there was a lot of, I think, um, really important social movement going on in, in Hollywood with the Me Too movement. And then also that trickled into the venture capital industry where a lot of really brave um, entrepreneurs from underrepresented backgrounds or, or female entrepreneurs had come to the press with these horrible stories about um, how they had gotten discriminated against or sexually harassed or abused by these VCs that they were pitching. Um, and it just really didn't sit right to me that, especially in, you know, especially like being an entrepreneur is already really, really hard. Um, and then to have to deal with racism and sexism and discrimination on top of that is just, especially from people who are supposed to be, you know, the gatekeepers of your success with providing you funding. Um, it just didn't really sit right with me that people had to go through that. And also the fact that this had continued on for years, maybe even decades for some of these really successful VCs. And um, they felt that they could really just get away with anything given their position. Um, so that really spurred me to just create what was at the time just a really, really spur of the moment side project called Know Your VC, essentially a Glassdoor slash Yelp for rating venture capitalists, um, not only for founders to rate venture capitalists, but VCs to rate other VCs too. So um, that was really the impetus for what turned into my second business. Hmm. So it was really motivated by a like social motivation to to improve 
other entrepreneurs experience in fundraising, it sounds like. Yeah, definitely. Because, uh, you know, I, as a guy, thankfully, I hadn't really come across any of this. So it was a complete shock to me to hear from, you know, friends and friends of friends that this was happening and happening in circles of people that, that I had known and actually talked to and pitched. So it just didn't really seem fair that you know, there was just two drastically different experiences for founders, just given, you know, given who they are, who they were born. I feel like the United States is still this land of opportunity because you have people born in the U.S., you have immigrants who come here and can start businesses. In your experience, is entrepreneurship this sort of level playing field where someone can create something out of nothing, which is what those are your words, or are there these massive challenges, you know, either as a woman or a person of color trying to start a business here? I think there still are challenges, but I think the internet, especially internet businesses, they're such a great equalizer, right? Because you really don't need to show your face to create a product right on on the internet a lot of people don't really care about the about us section as long as the product is really great or there's really huge value in whatever that person's building and um i think you're even seeing it with even more so with cryptocurrency right we don't even know who satoshi nakamoto is but he or she could be um you know could be a woman could be a person of color right we have no idea that person is the richest person in the world, most likely. So I think there is definitely opportunities to really be able to be anything when you start a business and become an entrepreneur, but there still are obviously going to be challenges when it comes to face-to-face -to -face, or it comes to maybe the education or tools to know how to start a business, right? That's why I think, you know, online courses and kind of the democratization of learning that we're seeing now, especially with you know, college campuses being shut down for the past year, I think that's accelerated a lot of those, those trends. What was the growth path like for Know Your VC? And how long were you running that company before the exit? So that one was, I think because of the social climate at the time, it, it really popped up really, really quickly. Um, we had gotten some good press right when we launched and um, within a few months, you know, we'd gotten tens of thousands of signups. We had um, a couple hundred thousand unique searches on the month on the platform for people searching for different VCs. Um, so it really grew quite quickly. And I think in terms of getting to that exit, it was about a year, actually. We had actually known the, the folks that ended up acquiring UBC ever since we started the business and we had remained close in terms of keeping progress on the business, how we'd grown. And um, when it kind of came time for us to think about what we want the future of NoUBC to be, it seemed like uh, the Rate My Investor team, they had a lot more resources than us. They, most importantly, I think were aligned on the same path for the company in terms of its, its social mission. And I think, um, found a really good future home for it. How did the social aspect of that business, how did that make you feel? Um, to me, it was really important, right? I was, I was still working at Joyrun at the time. This was, it was never really a, a full-time gig or it meant to be a full-time gig. Um, and I think for us, it, it, that's always a little bit tough as a business where, you know, you know that it needs to exist, but you don't really think of like, monetization or a revenue model or a strategy. And I think um, it really is a double-edged sword because on, on the plus side, you attract really, really motivated people um, who are in it for the mission, who really, really believe in it and will stick through it through thick and thin. But on the other side, if you're thinking about it from just a more so commercial perspective, you do have to be creative, right? Um, are we charging the entrepreneurs? Are we charging the VCs? What are other ways we can make money? Those are all questions that we had um, in terms of making that decision on if this was a, a 10, 20 year business for me or just kind of a, 
um, you know, a, a shorter lived one, which it turned to be. Interesting that it was a side project. As an entrepreneur, should one be focused on the monetization, how to monetize the business? Or is it okay to build it first and figure that out as you go? I think it's definitely okay to build it first, right? We still were able to provide a lot of value to the people using our website without there being any clear monetization strategy. I think as long as there's value being provided to the end user, you can be creative in finding ways to um, to grow a business into something that's sustaining for you know for people's salaries and how they need to live. Um, but I think the thing that you need to consider is by putting that monetization on what are you sacrificing, right? Are you sacrificing the growth trajectory? Are you sacrificing your total addressable market, right? Maybe a million people are down to use this website for free, but what subset of these users are willing to pay for it? Maybe 10,000, right? So then again, uh, you know, you have to be realistic in thinking how big, how big of a pie this business really is. So did you eventually get users paying? So we never got users to pay. We wanted to be free for the entrepreneur, which is who we built this product for. Um, but what we did charge for was the data that we were collecting, right? It was essentially kind of like a LinkedIn model where if a VC wanted to see who was viewing their profile or if um, an LP that was considering investing into a VC wanted to see data on, um, you know, reviews and things like that, then we could charge. Or um, another thing was to, to really sponsor the research that we're doing in terms of looking at um, the demographics of startup founders that have been funded. We were working with a lot of larger organizations like banks and other um, you know, research universities to be able to provide insights for the industry that larger players like a um, you know, like an EY or a, a Silicon Valley bank would you know, have, have the resources to pay for something like that. Interesting. I want to move on to what you're working on currently. You're founder and CEO of VinoVest, a platform that's been described as the Robin Hood of wine investing. How is it that you got interested in wine? So I've always been interested in wine. I grew up in Beijing and Hong Kong um, during a time where Bordeaux and Burgundy wine were really, really blowing up. So just from a cultural significance level, um, you know, you go to a friend's house, you bring a bottle of wine, right? And how much you want to impress that friend really kind of determines the type of wine that you're bringing there. Um, so I always thought it was pretty cool. Um, and I think after, after selling Envoy Now, I'd become an, interested in just investing in general. And, um, you know, you invest in the stock market, kind of get your basic portfolio, and then you want to start diversifying and learning about alternatives. And that's where I think I really developed a passion for alternatives in general. So whether that has been angel investing, which I started doing, investing in cryptocurrency and learning about new technologies, and then wine investing. Um, I remember coming across a few reports uh, touting its returns, how it's really, really stable and consistent over the past few decades and how it's annualized returns that actually with, I think around 11 or 12% annualized returns over the past 25 years had beaten out the stock market. So um, I was like, wow, this is so cool, right? I would love to be a little bit more cultured and learn more about wine anyways. And this seems like a great way to get some skin in the game and potentially make a profit as well. And that's really where the initial idea for VinoVest started to blossom. Who typically was investing in wine as an asset class? So that, that I think was also a reason why I decided to start a company around it was when I got into the space, I realized that there weren't any kind of like young, like early 20 something people investing in wine, right? If you think of a wine collector, you know, stereotypically you're thinking of someone who's much older, much wealthier, you know, typically male, right? Um, and it really just seemed like kind of a rich person's hobby, which I think for the most part it is, right? You need, you need a significant amount of wealth to be able to even afford some of these high-end wines. 
much less even be able to have the connections to get access to them because they're very, very rare and highly allocated. Secondly, even if you wanted to buy those wines, uh, most people don't own a wine cellar and owning and managing a large wine cellar and collection is extremely expensive. Having the climate control, having the insurance, even having the space and the cost to build it can cost tens of thousands of dollars. And then I think the last point was from a liquidity standpoint, how do you sell a bottle of wine today, right? You have to go to an auction or a brokerage house and they take massive fees, like 15 to 20% fees. And I'd never heard of those types of cuts in, in the traditional market, right? Or even in real estate and you know, less liquid assets. And I was like, that is, that is crazy. There's gotta be a more efficient way to do this, not only for myself, but maybe for other people like me who are maybe just curious and didn't really see that existing in the market. It was something that I was spending more and more of my free time on. And I was like, all right, mm-hmm. let's, uh, let's see if we can build a business around this. As you were kind of educating yourself to this like asset class in this market, how is it that you started investing in wine? Did you, did you like buy a first case and where do you put that? Like what was, how did you start? Yeah, I, w- I was a guinea pig, right? Because I, um, I was the one researching all of the competitors, all of, you know, developing relationships with the right folks in the wine industry, just kind of learning from people who had done this for several years. Like, you know, what are the goods and bads? What needs to improve versus what's good enough? Um, and definitely putting my money where my mouth is, you know, in terms of developing relationships, buying from these folks and developing the, um, really the solution that I thought would help not only someone like me who was at that point, like getting really obsessed into wine investing, but really the question was how simple of a solution would this need to be to get someone who really has no interest in wine, never knew anything about wine investing, but is just a savvy retail investor. How can we get that person to diversify into wine? And that's really, I think what had guided my, exploration along with my co-founder to be able to start the first version of Vino Best. So before creating the platform, did you start buying wine for yourself? Yeah, I had, I had wine stored, um, you know, in, in warehouses in Europe. And a lot of those are now the same warehouse that we use for Vino Best. So I was, uh, I was customer number one for myself. When we think about wine, I kind of do think of it as a rich person's sport. And I always kind of figured that they're buying it to drink and to have on hand. Do they actually buy it just for the investment? I think for a lot of people who have a passion in wine, it's a mix of both, right? Because say you buy 10 cases of a wine, you want to hold on to it because maybe it's not maybe it's not ready to drink yet, right? Maybe it needs to mature for a decade or two before it reaches its peak. But at that point, uh, maybe it's, you know, two or you know, increased by two or three X, you can sell off maybe two or three cases to be able to get your entire principal back. And at that point, you're just drinking really, really nice wine for free with your profits. So I think for a lot of people, maybe it's a way to help subsidize or bankroll a pretty expensive hobby. Uh, for other people, it is something where they can make a little bit of money on the side. And then um, for other people, maybe it's just purely financial because there are several asset managers that deal, deal pull fully with just wine as an alternative asset as well. Talking about the liquidity, if somebody bought you know, a, a bunch of wine and then they want to sell off some to cover their cost, where do they turn to sell that? Are they selling it to friends? Is there kind of a marketplace? You mentioned auction houses. Yeah, so I think the most popular way today is through auction houses, right? Your Christie's or Sotheby's, you know, they're doing several hundred million dollars of, of turnover. Um, but there are, I think, especially with the secondary market for wine, there are a lot of, I'd say, smaller regional stock exchanges where these are moving, you know, still, I'd say like several billion dollars worth of wine a year, but 
it's really not united on a central platform. And I think it's partly because of the way that things were always done. You know, I think wine in particular is an industry that is pretty old school in terms of its um, processes. And then the other is that there hasn't really been a need for there to be a more globalized solution. I think, uh, especially now with the pandemic, everyone realizing that things are needing to move to online. There has been a renewed push and interest for more business being transacted online versus offline. So Anthony, tell us how does Vino Vest work? Is it an app? Is it, I log on on my desktop? Yeah, so it's um, desktop and mobile, you can choose. And we really want it to be simple for someone who knows nothing about wine. So um, if you're thinking about any investment, I think what you want to figure out is how much of my you know, net worth I'm going to dedicate to this investment, right? So what's my kind of starting budget? Number two is what's my time horizon? So how long do I plan on holding this asset before getting my return? And then number three is what's my risk appetite for this, right? Am I thinking of this as something really, really safe and steady, or am I willing to take a little bit more risk and volatility to be able to get higher returns? So based on those inputs, those three questions, we have an algorithm that could then help build you your first wine portfolio. And just like stocks, there's your equivalent of, you know, your blue chips or like really large cap stable wines that have year after year yielded very steady, consistent, low volatility returns. And then if you want to go a little more aggressive, there's wine futures, there's also newer wineries or newer regions that are a bit more speculative in nature, but could yield higher than average returns as well. So that's how we really think about our portfolio construction when you say, um, I want a risky wine portfolio versus a safe wine portfolio. And we actually then go source those actual bottles and cases of wine. So the, the customer actually owns those wines, but we're the ones that are taking care of the wines in our facilities. So they're fully bonded and insured, safely secured so that they can age properly and that they can be in the best possible condition to be resold in the future. So we take care of all the physical logistics and um, the end customer can then check in on their portfolio anytime online, like any sort of you know, TD Ameritrade or Schwab or traditional um, online investing platform where everyone really expects to be able to get all the data they need and be able to make all the decisions they need at the touch of a button. The investing algorithm sounds really interesting. So it sounds like you're akin to a robo advisor, but for bottles of wine instead of securities, stocks, or yeah, bonds. Uh, the, 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 the investor can plug in time horizon risk, different metrics, and you're helping to put together a portfolio. With, with stocks, we can look at company earnings. You can look at price-to-earnings ratios. You can look at revenue growth. You can look at the management. What do wine investors look at when trying to make those decisions about risk to reward? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So I'd say in terms of evaluating a wine from an investment standpoint, there's really three key things. Number one is starting supply, right? Unlike most other assets, wine is a finite asset that also actually decreases in supply as it gets older, right? Say the company produces 10,000 bottles in the year 2020, by the time it's the year 2030, maybe there's only 2,000 bottles left, right? Just because of global consumption. So that inherently does prop up the price of the wine over time, just because there's less and less of it. Number two is the ageability of the wine. Some wines are meant to be consumed after 10 years. Some of them can age 20, 30 years. Usually the ones that are more ageable just have a longer time to be able to appreciate. And then there are also external factors. So critic scores um, are pretty important in terms of assessing the price to value ratio of wine, where say if a you know wine say initially has a 95 point rating, usually every five or 10 years, critics will then retaste it uh, to see how the wine has developed. And if it gets an upgrade, same as if an, you know, an analyst upgrade something from a double A AA to a triple A, 
usually there's a price premium that follows right after that. So there are sort of kind of market movers, so to say, um, and, and news that can also prop up the price of a bottle of wine. Do bottles of wine, there's got to be an expiration date, right? Like, you know, certain ones are kind of expected to age 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, but they can't go forever. So when you're investing in wine, do you have to have some kind of exit plan, meaning that you're either going to drink that bottle or you have to sell it somewhere? Absolutely. So I think that does play into the investors expected time horizon, right? If you're, if you're only in it for 10 years, we're not going to buy, uh, we're not going to buy you wines that maybe it'll take 20 to 30 years to really have it reach its full potential. Maybe we'll buy you a wine that's already 10 years old. So you can really be able to get the second half of its price appreciation. The other, I think perhaps fortunate thing is that wine is, um, it's very, very gradual, right? It's not like, um, milk where if it's three days old past the expiration it's really really bad wine is i think a lot more subjective than that so the drinking windows for wine it could be 15 through 20 years so there is still a quite a large time window for people to be able to decide if they want to exit or if not and some people like drinking wine that's a bit more mature versus early on so there's i think a wide spectrum of um, taste preferences which equals a wide spectrum of potential liquidity windows for an investor if they want to get out. Um, so there are there are sort of options in play that make it less, um, I'd say less of like a forced exit. But there is going to be an expiration date, right? Some of these ones you can't you can't hold on to a wine for a hundred years, but you could hold on to a stock for a hundred years um, if you know if you want to. Yeah, if not for you, but for your beneficiaries. Yeah, exactly. What's your advice to people as far as holding wine, buy and hold or a trader? Because I, as, you, as you think about trying to bring this to a younger investor and broader investment base, some of them I think are coming from like a mentality of trading crypto. And some of that is like day trading stocks, very short term. So What's your advice for people when it comes to wine? I think there's going to be room for both. Um, you know, why, why are there day traders in the stock market, even though the fundamentals are definitely not going to change within a 24 hour period for the most part, right? Same with crypto. It's almost purely speculation, but I think that kind of gambling nature is inherent in a lot of people. People think that they can beat the market. Um, and I think, with any market, you want to at least allow for the capability of these sorts of investors to exist. Um, but I think with most most investments, right, with real estate, with the stock market, it's better to also have a long term outlook on at least a part of your portfolio, and that can maybe counter some of the volatility that the day traders are experiencing on a day to day basis. So um, I'd say keep keep a bit of both and experiment with with what you'd like to do. And what are the risks for investing in wine? I think the key thing is just a um, fraud and counterfeiting, and two is storage. Um, I realize I said A and two it should have been A and B or one and two, but uh, but uh, yeah, um, I think with the counterfeiting and risk, like anything that's a a luxury item or an item that is in. Um, finite supply and has more demand than it has supply, there's going to be people trying to make fakes. So knowing who you're buying from, knowing that it's actually the real bottle is really, really important. And then on a storage standpoint, you know, you really do need to keep that wine in perfect condition or else it'll, you know, it'll, it'll turn to vinegar and it becomes worthless, right? So um, both of those were able to really, really help a newcomer with that may not know proper storage or may not know how to properly authenticate a bottle of wine because we have professional storage facilities. You know, they even store the British Royal family's wine in the same facility. So they've got top of line um, security, they've got top of line climate control and really robust insurance in case of anything else that happens. So we're really able to de-risk the storage component 
And then finally, from the authenticity component, we're buying direct from the wineries, right? So you can't really get better, um, better provenance than that. And even when we do buy secondhand, we're only buying from trusted, um, you know, wine merchants or wine distributors that have only bought it directly from the winery. So we're actually able to trace back the um, kind of the trail of provenance to the direct winery that it actually was produced from. This is a relatively new company for you. Did you start in 2020? Like what has the adoption rate been? And is it easy trying to educate people? This is, this is a market that many people don't even, like your potential investors, they didn't know about until recently. And you need to educate them. We, we are a young company. Um, we really launched in 2020. And the adoption, I think, because of COVID, I think with a lot of kind of like financial or investing related apps, have seen a lot of tailwinds, right? People are just sitting at home. They've got more time to think about their finances and realizing that they probably need to diversify given the state of the stock market. So um, we have seen some pretty incredible growth. You know, we're pretty much doubling our business every single quarter. And on the education component, I think we've just come across it um, really in the spirit of being open-minded and being accessible, saying that wine investing is for everybody. You know, whether you drink wine or not, if you're looking at it purely financially, something that has double digit returns and very little volatility should be something that you can consider adding to your portfolio. So um, for the people that aren't into wine, they're the numbers that are very attractive. For the people who are into wine, it's kind of like a cherry on top where they can really talk with their friends or make it a more social investing experience because you know it's a lot more fun to talk about just around the dinner table than you know uh, most traditional investments. Right, talking about your newly acquired case of wine from some region and why you like it. Exactly. Is wine investing just individuals or is this something that family offices get involved with? Like, are there endowments that want to invest in wine? What does that look like? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of institutions right now are thinking of alternative ways to be able to bring meaningful yield to their clients or to their investors. I'd say for the VinoVest platform, we are still very much so retail focused. Um, there, are, you know, our, our minimum only starts at a thousand dollars, right? We're a self-serve platform, but we also have very large um, investors that are putting in significant amounts of capital, um, you know, quarter million, million dollars into wine, where you know maybe the entire portfolio they're managing is fifty million or in the hundreds of millions. So we are starting to see some more. Um, serious capital starting to flow into this market. And I think that's really how most new asset classes start, right? In, in cryptocurrency, it was just, you know, the average retail investor. And now it's definitely become, uh, you know, an institutional asset. So I think it'll, it'll take time, but I definitely do believe it'll get there. So $1,000 minimum investment, what are the fees? Our fees are a 2.85% annualized management fee. Uh, it drops down to 2% as you put in more and more capital. And it pretty much covers everything that you need on the platform. So our storage, the insurance, the use of our, our algorithm, and you pretty much don't pay anything else after that, You know, even when you want to liquidate. And how does one value the portfolio? That's a great question. Because so, there's not an exchange, right? It's it's not exactly. Is there mark to market with wine? So what we really try to do is pull data from a variety of sources. So there are quite a few regionalized exchanges, but as you mentioned, um, the mark to market is tough when there are different countries, different currencies. Um, and what we try to do is be able to mark you against the most recently sold bottle of wine of that particular vintage. Or when there isn't, what we do is we go by what the lowest available for sale bottle of wine at that particular vintage is. So those are kind of the ways that we look for accurate valuation to be able to have people be able to trust and be able to um, look at the platform and look at our data as an accurate representation of the value of what they're investing in. 
And if I have an account and I own a wine that I want to sell, how how does that get liquidated? Do you have to find a buyer? Can you make an exchange within the platform from one user to another? How does that work? Yeah, so both happen today. So we can either sell it to another buyer if we have another buyer looking for that particular case of wine, or you know, there's a ton of other third parties that we work with, whether they be wine distributors or wine retailers or high-end restaurants that are looking to acquire wine more from a consumption angle. And for us, like we don't care why you're buying the wine, as long as you're buying at the best price, we know that we're doing right by our customer in terms of matching them up with the highest bidder. Anthony, I'd like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? I think success is if you love everything that you're doing in a day. Sounds simple. Yeah, it's a uh, sounds simple but hard to get to, right? Uh, so, yeah, that's that's what I aspire to every day. And as an entrepreneur, how do you view money? Um, I think I'm definitely money motivated, right? I want to be able to have things in my life that can ensure for me to be, you know, safe and healthy and for the people I love to be safe and healthy and to be able to, um, use it to create change, right? As at a certain point, the extra, you know, extra million dollars or more won't really matter that much in my daily life. So then I want to think about how I can use it to help other people's daily lives. So I think at a certain point, and you see this with a lot of very, very monetarily successful people is they switch their focus on what can their money do for them into what can their money do for others. And I'd love to get to that point as well. Well, thank you for sharing your personal journey with us as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, being able to lead companies in the face of you know, the, the terrible accident that you had and, and educating us on wine. I think many of us hadn't thought of wine as an investment. Can you tell the Inspired Money listener where to follow you and where to learn more? Yeah, and um, to follow us, we're just at vinovest.co and we're really accessible. You, know, you can email us, chat us, hit us up on any of your pro, uh, preferred social media platforms and you know, we'll be there to help answer. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Andy. What was your favorite Inspired Money moment? I found Anthony's story to be truly extraordinary, especially when it reminds us of the fragility of our health and our lives. We cannot take anything for granted. I love Anthony's entrepreneurial spirit. It's so strong that I believe it helped him during his recovery. It was cool to hear him talking about solving his fellow students' food delivery needs or wanting to improve the fundraising experience for his fellow entrepreneurs or scratching his own itch of making wine investing easier. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, please let me know by posting a comment below. For watching until the end, thank you for watching until the end. I want to send you an Inspired Money sticker. Go to inspiredmoney.fm slash Andy, send me your name and address, and I will send you a sticker in the mail. Thank you so much for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that is where the magic happens.